<coughs> ah. Ah. Horace. Horace, I've searched everywhere. I can't find it. Hold on. Mrs. Davis, did you see Horace's notebook while you were cleaning? Near the pile of books. <laughs> Which pile of books? Oh, hello. How do you do? <laughs> Excuse me for a moment, please. Horace, I can't find it. No, no, don't come back up. I'll keep searching for it. I'll give it to you tonight. You'll bring the carriage round at 8 o'clock. Fine. Yes, I'll be here. If a celebration is being given for Walt Whitman, Walt himself had best show up. <laughs> Howdy do. <laughs> Forgive the confusion and excuse the mess. Mrs. Davis, my housekeeper, calls this room utterly indecent. Disorder added to disorder. Not a fit place for a man or his visitors. Well, I reminded her of what a critic once said about my book, Leaves of Grass. It is a confused book. The author gets mixed up at the start and is never put to order again. That explains the room, Mrs. Davis, I said. Nevertheless, when she heard you were coming, she took it upon herself to um, <clears throat> tidy things up. Well, she's arranged everything so I don't know where a goddamn thing is. Bless her, I know her heart is in the right place, as is Horace's. Horace and his notebook. Oh, Horace is my neighbor, friend, confidant. He visits most every day, now you know, and records our conversations writes everything I say down in his little black book. Oh, I don't mind. In fact, I want him to. As long as he writes about me honest, doesn't prettify me. <laughs> I told him, be sure to include ugh, all the hells and dams. <laughs> but how are you? Howdy do, howdy do, ain't that a good word? It has phonetic significance. A truly American greeting rolls off the tongue more readily than good evening, don't you think? Myself, well now, the doctor says from a medical point of view, I'm getting along all right. But from my point of view, I'm in a pretty boggy condition indeed. But so long as the doctor feels all right about it, I don't suppose it matters how I feel. <laughs> I like to see the doctor comfortable anyway. I can still write, read, work, laugh, cry, be myself in most ways. I suppose I shouldn't kick because I can't climb mountains. But 70, tonight there's a celebration in honor of my 70th year, 70 years. I suppose it's fitting then that you're here and that you want to know about me and the leaves, my leaves of grass. Well, now, I've had a lot of visitors lately. Do you know Oscar Wilde? He was here, a fine, large, handsome youngster, smart, had the good sense to take a liking to me. <laughs> but I don't agree with his art for art's sake notions. Like literature for literature's sake, writing created from such a principle removes us from humanity. Ugh. It is only from humanity that the light can come. Now, I never wanted to be a witness or a savior for exceptional men. I wanted Leaves of Grass to be read by the average man, the common man, like yourself. Proof of a poet is that his country absorbs him as affectionately as he has absorbed it. Those are my words, the task I set for myself right from the start. But now as I stand here gossiping amongst the candlelight of old age, 
casting a backward glance over our traveled roads, I must admit I've not been embraced, not by those that meant the most to me. I know that from a business and from a worldly point of view, the leaves has proved to be worse than a failure. I cannot separate myself from the book. I have thrown my life into the book, but the people, I wanted to reach the people, but I, oh, oh well, I'm, I'm getting to be a sort of monologuer. <laughs> it is a disease that falls on a man that has no legs to walk on. <clears throat> you know, when I was younger, I was to be an orator, knew I had something to say, was afraid I wouldn't get a chance to say it through books. I had designs for all sorts of schemes, which were never executed. Lectures, plays, God help me, took me some time to get down or up to my proper measure. For years I'd been writing with no particular direction. The words seemed disconnected from myself, my true self, my soul. And then in my mid-30s, it occurred to me that America, like myself, had yet to find its own voice, its own poetry. It was this, the desire to be America's poet, that really got me started. I took to the open air, to nature, and wrote, wrote, wrote. The words came spilling out. I had an experience at that time a mystical experience, you might call it. One early summer morning, I walked far out into a field. The quiet was all around me. I was alone. I lay down on the damp earth. I felt the sun on my face. I asked my soul to loaf with me on the grass. Loose the stop from your throat. Not words, not music or rhyme I want, not custom or lecture, not even the best. Only the lull I like, the hum of your valved voice. I mind how once we lay such a transparent summer morning and you settled your head athwart my hips and gently turned over upon me and parted the shirt from my bosom bone and plunged your tongue to my bare stripped heart and reached till you felt my beard and reached till you held my feet. Swiftly arose and spread all around me the peace and knowledge that pass all the argument of the earth. And I know that the hand of God is the promise of my own. And I know the spirit of God is the brother of my own. And all the men that ever lived are my brothers and the women, my sisters and lovers, and that a calcin of the creation is love and limitless are leaves, stiff or drooping in the fields and brown ants in the little wells beneath them and the mossy scab of the worm fence, heap stone, elder, mullen and pokeweed. <laughs> I cannot be awake, for nothing looks to me as it did before, or else I'm awake for the first time, and all before has been a mean sleep. I created a character like me, yet unlike me, an extension of myself, the way I long to be perceived. This Walt Whitman was one of my changes of garments. Walt Whitman, a cosmos of Manhattan the sun, turbulent, fleshy, sensual, eating, drinking, and breeding. No sentimentalist. No stander above men and women or apart from them. No more modest than immodest. Unscrew the locks from the doors. Unscrew the doors themselves from their jams. The poems continue to come. I celebrate myself and sing myself. 
and what I assume you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, every atom of my blood, formed from this soil, this air, born here, of parents born here, from parents the same and their parents the same, I now in perfect health begin, afoot and lighthearted, I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me, leading wherever I choose. Henceforth I ask not good fortune, I myself am good fortune. Henceforth I whimper no more, postpone no more, need nothing, done with indoor complaints, libraries, querulous criticisms, strong and content, I travel the open road. Have you reckoned a thousand acres much? Have you reckoned the earth much? Have you practiced so long to learn to read? Have you felt so proud to get at the meaning of poems? Stop this day and night with me, and you shall possess the origin of all poems. You shall possess the good of the earth and the sun. There are millions of suns left. You shall no longer take things at second or third hand, or look through the eyes of the dead, or feed on the specters in books. You shall not look through my eyes either, or take things from me. You shall listen to all sides and filter them from yourself. Take my leaves, America. Take them south, take them north. Make welcome for them everywhere, for they are your own offspring. Surround them east and west, for they would surround you. And you precedents, connect lovingly with them, for they would connect lovingly with you. I conned old times. I sat studying at the feet of the great masters. Now, if eligible, oh, that the great masters might return and study me. Dead poets, philosophers, priests, martyrs, artists, inventors, governments long since, language shapers on other shores, nations once powerful now reduced, withdrawn, or desolate. I dare not proceed till I respectfully credit what you have wafted hither. <laughs> well, I have perused it, think it is admirable, think nothing can ever be more greater than it is, nothing deserve more credit, and yet I stand in my place with my own day here. My own day. <laughs> well, <laughs> wasn't easy. Right from the start, I was surrounded by opposition and advice, even concerning the title, Leaves of Grass. There are no leaves of grass, Walt. Those are your words. There are spears of grass. Spears? Spears would not have been the same to me. Etymologically speaking, leaves is correct. Scientific men use it, so I stuck with it. Leaves. <laughs> I never write a word someone don't object to. The thing one likes, another don't. It's God bless you for this, God damn you for that. Now, I used to think God was everywhere. I was wrong. The advisor is everywhere. Well, take my advice. Never take advice. I published my poems myself. I set some of the type myself. I paid the printing costs myself. 
Soon reviews appeared praising Leaves of Grass, written anonymously by me. <laughs> and then, of course, there were the other reviews. Who is this arrogant young man who proclaims himself poet of time and who roots like a pig among the rotten garbage of licentious thought? <laughs> This leaves of grass proves to be no more than a heterogeneous mix of bombast, egotism, vulgarity, and nonsense. <sighs> it is impossible to imagine how any man could conceive such a mass of stupid filth unless he were possessed of the soul of a sentimental donkey who has died of disappointed love. <laughs> well, I don't know if you ever realize just what it means to be a horror in the sight of those about you. Well, anyway, I had also sent first copies of Leaves of Grass to various esteemed men of letters, and I got little response. But one of those responses was great. So great, I keep it here with me. May I read it to you? <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Concord, Massachusetts, 21st July, 1855. Dear Sir, I am not blind to the worth of the wonderful gift of Leaves of Grass. I find it the most extraordinary piece of wit and wisdom that America has yet contributed. I'm very happy in reading it as great power makes us happy. I give you joy of your free and brave thought. I have great joy in it. I find incomparable things said incomparably well as they must be. I find the courage of treatment which so delights me and which large perception only can inspire. I greet you at the beginning of a great career which yet must have had a long foreground somewhere for such a start. I rub my eyes a little to see if the sunbeam were no illusion but the solid sense of the book is a sober certainty. It has the best merits, namely of fortifying and encouraging. I did not know until I last night saw the book advertised in a newspaper that I could trust the name as real and available for a post office. I wished to see my benefactor and it felt much like striking my tasks and visiting New York to pay you my respects, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Oh, this letter electrified me, this glorious letter. It inspired me to continue writing with free and brave thought, and so I did. You know, it is funny. In retrospect, it is funny that this man who motivated me so, this idol, this Emerson, was later to, to advise. Have you been to Boston? Hmm? I have on many occasions once to visit Emerson. Strange old Boston with its zigzag streets, its multitudinous angles. Crush up a piece of letter paper in your hand, throw it down, stamp it flat with your foot, <laughs> and there you have a map of Boston. I've spent a good deal of time walking along the Boston Common. I know all of the old trees along Tremont and Beacon Streets, and oh, I've come to a sociable, silent understanding with most of them. Between these same elms, I walked for two hours one bright, clear February morning with Emerson. Now, during this walk, he was the talker, I was the listener. His talk was an argument. In fact, it was an outright attack against the construction of my poems, especially Children of Adam. Now, in those poems, I wanted to celebrate the human body, the male and female form and function. I felt it necessary to describe the body and its parts in full. For instance, this is the female form a divine nimbus exhales from it from head to foot. 
it attracts with fierce, undeniable attraction. I am drawn by its breath as if I were no more than a helpless vapor. All falls aside but myself and it. Books, art, religion, time, the visible and solid earth, and all that was expected of heaven or feared of hell are now consumed. Mad filaments, ungovernable shoots play out of it, the response likewise ungovernable. Hair, bosom, hips, bend of legs, negligent falling hands, all diffused, mind too diffused, ebb stung by the flow, and flow stung by the ebb, love, flesh, swelling and deliciously aching, limitless, limpid jets of love, hot and enormous, quivering jelly of love, white glow and delirious juice, bridegroom night of love, working surely and softly into the prostrate dawn, undulating into the willing and yielding day, lost, in the cleave of the clasping and sweet flesh day. <sighs> well, <laughs> I described the female form too fully, Emerson seemed to think, and he wasn't alone. He urged me to drop several passages. By doing so, he said that I would appeal to a wider audience Quiet the critics who called me obscene and allow all that was good about Leaves of Grass to shine through. Advice. Well, what have you to say to such things, Walt? He asked. Well, I can't answer them all, but I feel more settled than ever to adhere to my own theories and to exemplify them. Saying those words to him were more precious than gold to me, though I could never hear the points better put. I felt down in my soul the utmost conviction to destroy all and to pursue my own way. Censor, no. I want the utmost freedom, the utmost license rather than any censorship. Censorship is always bad, always ignorant. Now, whether the censor is a man of virtue like Emerson or a hypocrite seems to me to make no difference. The evil is always evil. I wrote Children of Adam to celebrate the eternal decency, glory, and wonder of our human forms, was I to censor this celebration? Oh, my body, I dare not desert the likes of you and other men and women, nor the likes of the parts of you. I believe the likes of you are to stand or fall with the soul, and that they are the soul. I believe the likes of you are to stand or fall with my poems, and that they are my poems, man's, Woman's, child's, youth's, wife's, husband's, mother's, father's, young man's, young woman's poems, head, neck, hair, ears, drop and tympan of the ears, eyes, eye fringes, iris of the eyes and the waking or sleeping of the lids, mouth, lips, teeth, tongue, roof of the mouth, jaws, jaw hinges, nose, nostrils of the nose and the partition, cheeks, temples, forehead, chin, throat, back of the neck, neck slew, strong shoulders, manly beard, scapula, hind shoulders, and the ample side round of the chest, upper arm, armpit, elbows, arm sinews and bones, wrists and wrist joints, hands, palms, knuckles, four fingers, finger joints, finger nails, broad breast front, curling hair of the breast, breast bone, breast side, ribs, belly, backbone, and the joints of the backbone, hips, hip sockets, hip strength, inward and outward round, man, balls, man, root, strong set of thighs, well carrying the trunk above, upper leg, under leg, ankle, instep, football, toes, heels, all attitudes 
all the shapeliness, all the belongings of my body or your body or anyone's body, male or female. The curious sympathy one feels when feeling with one's hand the naked meat of the body, the circling rivers, the breath, and breathing it in and out, the beauty of the waist, and thence the hips, and thence downward toward the knees, the thin red jellies within you and within me, the bones and the marrow in the bones, the exquisite realization of health. Oh, I say to you now, these are not the parts and poems of the body only, but of the soul. I say to you now, these are the soul. Well, how some people reel when I say this part, <laughs> or that part, or bare legs and belly. God, you might suppose I was citing some diabolical obscenity. <laughs> uh. Soon after Leaves of Grass was published, I received another letter, one I don't carry with me. This one was from an earnest preacher way up in Maine. He said, if I wrote more like other people and less like myself, other people would like me better. I have no doubt they would. But where would Walt Whitman come in on that deal? I hear it was charged against me that I sought to destroy institutions. But what indeed have I in common with them? Now, I'm not traditionally religious, I know it, but I'm not anti, yet I've been called so irreligious and infidel. God help me. I think the leaves, the most religious book among books, crammed full of faith. What indeed would the leaves be without faith an empty vessel? Still, most preachers are not friendly towards me. Now, I do not hate them or despise them, but all of their sermonizing, their preaching, and their prayer are weariness to me. Why should I pray? Why should I venerate and be ceremonious? Why should I skulk or find myself indecent? while well, birds and animals never skulk or find themselves indecent. Sometimes I think I could turn and live with animals. They are so placid and self-contained. I stand and look at them long and long. They do not sweat and whine about their condition. They do not lie awake in the dark and weep for their sins. They do not make me sick discussing their duty to God. Not one is dissatisfied. Not one is demented with this mania of owning things. Not one kneels to another, nor to his kind that lived thousands of years ago. Not one is respectable or unhappy over the whole earth, but we, we talk about salvation. We need most to be saved from ourselves, from our own hates and fears and jealousies. We need that salvation in the worst way. And now we've got so in our civilization, so-called, that we are afraid to face the body and its issues. We shrink from the realities of our bodily lives. We refer to the function of the man and woman, their sex, passion, and normal desires, to something which is to be lied about, kept in the dark, instead of being avowed and glorified in, though we will not allow it to be freely spoken of. It is still the basis of all that makes life worthwhile, don't you think? 
Sex advances the horizons of discovery. Sex, sex, sex. Whether you sing, make a machine, love your mother, go to the North Pole, shine shoes, or anything, sex is the root of it all. And yet, even as I celebrate, I confess, I'm plagued by my own doubts, fears, excesses. Yes, even I, Walt Whitman, turbulent, brave, free, ha! Do I contradict myself? Very well, then. I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. Look, I've made mistakes. I've said things I shouldn't have said, and I've been quiet when I should have spoken. Come now, and I will take you beneath this impassive exterior. This hour, I will tell things in confidence. I may not tell everyone, but I will tell you. Are you the new person drawn towards me? To begin with, take warning, for I'm surely far different than you suppose. Do you suppose yourself advancing on real ground towards a real heroic man? Have you no thought, O oh dreamers, it may be all Maya, illusion? There is that in me. I do not know what it is, but it is in me. It is a word unsaid. It is not in any dictionary. Through me, forbidden voices, voices of sex and lust, the voices veiled, voices unlaunched. A young man is enamored of me, and I of him. But towards him, there is something fierce and terrible in me, eligible to burst. He masters me, me, ever open and helpless, bereft of my strength, utterly abject, groveling on the ground before him. This must stop, stop this cheating, childish abandonment of myself, fancying what does not really exist in another, but is all the time in myself alone. It is imperative I must obviate and remove myself from this incessant, enormous perturbation, give up absolutely and for good this feverish, fluctuating, undignified pursuit. <sighs> Cannot possibly be a success. Let there be no faltering. Not once, from this time forth, for life. I am he that aches with amorous love. Does not the earth gravitate? Does not all matter aching attract all matter? I I am he who knows the pangs of unrequited love. Agonies are one of my changes of garments, but now I think there is no unreturned love. The pay is certain one way or another. I loved a person ardently, and my love was not returned. And yet out of that, I have written these songs. When I heard at the close of day how my name had been received with plaudits in the capital, still it was not a happy night for me that followed. And else when I caroused and when my plans were accomplished, still I was not happy. But the day at dawn when I rose at bed in perfect health, saw the full moon in the west grow pale and disappear in the morning light, 
when I wandered the beach alone and on dressing bathed, laughing with the cool waters and saw the sunrise, and when I thought how my dear friend, my lover, was on his way coming, oh, then I was happy. Oh, then each breath tasted sweeter, and all that day my food nourished me more, and the beautiful day passed well, and with the next came my friend. And that night, while all was still, I heard the waters roll slowly, continuously along the shore. I heard the hissing rustle of liquid and sand as directed towards me, whispering to congratulate me for the one I love most lay by me sleeping under the same cover in the open air. In the autumn moonbeams, his face was inclined towards mine. His arm lay gently across my breast. And that night, I was happy. Dazzling and tremendous. How quick the sunrise would kill me if I could not now and always send sunrise out of me. Writing was now my redemption through it all, through the battles inside me and the battles that were to come. But the real war, the real leaves of grass, the real Walt Whitman were yet to come. Well. <laughs> Things were going well enough. Leaves of Grass was now in its third edition, gaining some recognition, though primarily amidst a small group of literati in England. In America, I was still widely unread, still maligned. It had become a rallying cry with a group of men in this country, down Walt Whitman, down him in any way, by any method, using any weapon you can, but down him drive him into obscurity, hurry him into oblivion. But suppose Walt Whitman is stubborn, stays, stays again and will not be downed. Afoot and lighthearted, I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me leading wherever I choose. So far, so well. But the best in most of my poems, I perceived, remained unwritten. The path to the house was made. But where was the house itself? I was simmering, 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 simmering. And of those who were reading me, who was really hearing? I wondered, who learns my lesson complete? Boss, journeyman, apprentice? Churchmen and atheist, the stupid and the wise thinker, parents and offspring, merchant, clerk, porter, customer, editor, author, artist, and schoolboy. Draw nigh and commence. Well, it is no lesson. It lets down the bars to a good lesson, and that to another, and everyone to another still. It is no small matter, this round and delicious globe moving so exactly in its orbit forever and ever without one jolt or the untruth of a single second. I do not think it was made in six days, <laughs> nor in 10,000 years, nor planned or built one thing after another as an architect plans and builds a house. I do not think 70 years is the time of a man or woman, or that 70 millions of years is the time of a man or woman, or that years will ever stop the existence of me or anyone else. Is it wonderful that I should be immortal? As everyone is immortal, I know it is wonderful, but my eyesight is equally wonderful and how I was conceived in my mother's womb and passed from a babe in the creeping trance of a couple of summers and winters to articulate and to walk. All this is wonderful.
and that my soul embraces you this hour and that we affect one another is wonderful and that I can think such thoughts as these and remind you and you think them and know them to be true is wonderful and that the moon spins round the earth and on with the earth is wonderful and that they balance themselves with the sun and the stars is wonderful. And I do not understand what can be more wonderful than myself. I have said that nothing, not God, is more important than oneself. <laughs> Do I use I too often? Hmm? I, I, I. This is not egotism purely. You see, all I have sought to do with Leaves of Grass is to put a person, a human being, myself in the latter half of the 19th century in America, freely, fully, and truly on record. Now, I realize that the best way to express all of this, that, that I must be the center from which the poems radiate, while indeed there could be no other. So I was content for a long while to dismiss everything and to dote on myself. Now all of this might have gone on and on and on and come to naught had I not been shaken, ripped up from my very roots, blasted out of my self-absorption by the occurrence of our civil war. It was the war. Its sights and scenes and the thousands and tens and twenties of thousands of American men wounded, operated on, dying, that opened up a whole new world to me. It gave me closer insight, new things, made me explore deeper minds than any yet. It was the war that really made me pray, brought me to my knees. I cried out, must I change my triumphant songs? Must I indeed learn to chant the cold dirges of the baffled and the sullen hymns of defeat? The year was 1861, year that trembled and reeled beneath me. Your summer wind was warm enough, yet the air I breathed froze me. A thick gloom fell from the sunshine and darkened me. There could be no dainty rhymes or sentimental love verses for you, terrible year. I wrote a rally cry. Beat, beat drums, blow, bugles blow, through the windows, through the doors, burst like a ruthless force into the solemn church and scatter the congregation, into the school where the scholar is studying. Leave not the bridegroom quiet, no happiness must he have now with his bride, nor the peaceful farmer any peace plowing his grain. So fierce you were and pound you drums, so shrill you bugles blow. The day was April 12th, 1861, I remember clearly. I just left the opera. I was walking down Broadway toward the Brooklyn Ferry. Suddenly I heard the loud cries of the newspaper boys tearing, yelling up the street, rushing from side to side. There'd been a firing on Fort Sumter and the United States flag at Charleston. This marked the start of the secession war. I cried out, beat, beat drums, blow, bugles blow, over the traffic of cities, over the rumble of wheels in the streets. Are beds prepared for sleepers at night in their houses? No sleepers must sleep in those beds. Would the talkers be talking? Would the singer attempt to sing? Then rattle quicker, heavier drums, you bugles wilder blow. The crowds read the newspaper headlines, shivering in small groups in the rain. I can see them there now under the lamps at midnight. I can see their faces again. My brother George Whitman was quick and eager to enlist in the 13th Regiment. 
you see in New York and in Brooklyn, we all thought the rebellion would be crushed in a few days or weeks. But oh, all that feeling changed with the terrible shock, the battle of first Bull Run. It was July 20th, 21st. The air was hot to the extreme. All of the men with this coating of murk and sweat and rain pouring over Long Bridge, a horrible march of 20 miles returning to Washington baffled, humiliated, panic struck. Where are your banners now? And the proud boast with which you went forth. Where are your bands of music and your ropes to bring back your prisoners? Well, there isn't a band playing, and there isn't a flag but clings lank and a shame close to its staff. You know, when the war began, it didn't seem so horrible to me at the time whilst I was so busy in the midst of its barbarism as it does now in retrospect. Still, I never once questioned the decisions that led me into the war. Whatever the years have brought, whatever sickness, whatnot, I've accepted the results as inevitable and right. I entered the war to find my brother George. My family received notice that he'd been wounded, dead for all we knew. I quickly left for Washington to find him. Letters. My memories of war are filled with letters, letters piled high, letters strewn, some cherished, some never opened, letters to lovers, letters from mothers to sons, and from sons to mothers. And this one was my first. Dear, dear mother, I succeeded in reaching the camp of the 51st New York and found George alive and well. When I found out this was so, you may imagine how trifling all my little cares and difficulties seemed they vanished into nothing. And now that I've lived for eight or nine days amid such scenes as the camps furnished, and had a practiced part in it all, and realized the way hundreds and thousands of good men are now living, not only without comfort, but with death and sickness, really nothing we call trouble is worth talking about. One of the first things that met my eyes in camp was a heap of feet, arms, and legs under a tree in front of the hospital. George was wounded by a shell, a gash in the cheek, but it has healed without difficulty already. I will stay here for the present, long enough to see if I can get any employment. Of course, I'm unsettled at the moment. Dear mother, my love, Walt, I stayed throughout most of the war working as a government clerk and writing essays for the New York papers. But my real work was visiting the sick and wounded in hospital. In a sense, this was the most real work of my life. Books are all very well, but this sort of thing is so much better, don't you think? As life in life, is always superior to life in a book. For four years I saw war where war is worst. Not on the battlefields, no. In hospital, there, war is worst. I mixed with it. My habit was to prepare for my daily and nightly visits which lasted for four or five hours each. By fortifying myself with a good night's rest, a bath, a good meal, clean clothes, and this is important, as cheerful a presence as possible. The soldiers are mere lads, many of them only 15, 
16, 17 years old, as I move from boy to poor boy, I always try to give a trifle or a word without exception. I give all kinds of sustenance, blackberries, lemons, brandy, wine, tobacco. Of course, I always give paper, stamps, and envelopes. And then I find the most needy cases, and I devote my time and services to them, to many of these wounded, sick, and dying soldiers, there is something in personal love and caresses that does more good than all the medicine in the world. And so I make my rounds. Some of my boys get well, and some of my boys die. Letters. Another to be written, another to be read. Mr. and Mrs. Haskell, dear friends, I thought it would be soothing to you to have a few words about the last days of your son, Erastus Haskell of Company K. From the time he came to Armory Square Hospital till he died, there was hardly a day, but I was with him a portion of the time. I'm only a friend visiting the wounded and sick soldiers not connected with any society or state. From the first, I felt that Erastus was in danger, or at least much worse than they in the hospital supposed. I was very anxious he should be saved. Poor boy, I can see him as I write. He was tanned, had a fine head of hair, looked good in the face, and was in pretty good flesh too when he first came in. He had his hair cropped close about 10, 12 days before he died. He never complained. But it was pitiful to see him lying there with such a look out of his eyes. He had large, clear eyes. They seemed to talk better than any words. Many nights I would sit by his bedside in the hospital till late. The lights would be put out, yet I would sit there hours, perhaps fanning him. He never said much, but I know he felt my presence there. It was a curious and a solemn scene. The wounded and sick soldiers lying around on their cots, just visible in the darkness, and close at hand on what proved to be his deathbed, this poor young boy. I do not know his past life, but what I do know, and what I saw of him, he was a noble boy. I think you have reason to be proud of such a son. I think his relatives have cause to treasure his memory. He's one of the thousands of American men in the ranks about whom there's no record of fame, no fuss made about their dying so young. Yet I find in them the most loyal and precious ones of this land, giving themselves up, I, even their young and their precious lives in this country's cause. Though we are strangers and shall probably never meet, I send you and all Erastus' brothers and sisters my love. Walt Whitman. Have you seen someone die? Have you had the privilege? I have hundreds, thousands of times I've seen the deaths of these brave young men. I've leaned close and whispered to them. I've kissed them on their lips, and I've wished them well on their way. Vigils, wondrous, strange, beautiful, what indeed is finally beautiful except death and love? Vigil strange I kept on the field one night when you, my son, and my comrade dropped at my side that day. One look I but gave which your dear eyes returned with the look I shall never forget. One touch of your hand to mine, O oh boy, reached up as you lay on the ground. Then onward I sped in the battle, the even contested battle, till late in the night, relieved to the place at last, again I made my way. 
found you in death so cold, dear comrade, found your body, son of responding kisses, never again on earth responding, bared your face in the starlight, curious the scene, cool blue the moderate night wind, Long there and then in vigil I stood, dimly around me the battlefield spreading, vigil wondrous and vigil sweet there in the fragrant, silent night, but not a tear fell, not even a long-drawn sigh. Long, long I gazed, then on the earth, partially reclining, sat by your side, resting my chin in my hands, passing sweet hours in mortal and mystic hours with you, dearest comrade, vigil of silence, love, and death, Vigil for you, my son, and my soldier, as onward, silently, stars aloft, eastward, new ones, upward stole. Vigil final for you, brave boy. I could not save you. Swift was your fate. I faithfully loved and cared for you living. I think we shall surely meet again, till at latest lingering of the night, Indeed, just as the dawn appeared, my comrade, I wrapped in his blanket, folded the blanket well, tucking it carefully overhead and carefully under feet. And there and then, and bathed by the rising sun, my son in his grave, in his rude dug grave, I deposited, ending my vigil strange with that, vigil of night and battlefield dim, vigil for son of responding kisses, never again on earth responding. Vigil I never forget, how as day brightened, I rose from the chill ground, folded my soldier well in his blanket and buried him where he fell. <sighs> Such was the war. <laughs> it was not a quadrille in a ballroom. Future years will never know the seething hell of countless scenes, and it is best they should not. The real war will never get in the books. Its interior history will not only not be written, its deeds and passions never even suggested. And as to the actual soldier and all his ways, his incredible dauntlessness, his fierce strength and animal magnetism, shall never be written and perhaps should not be. So goodbye to war. And now I say, God damn them. God damn them, God damn them, God damn them. All wars. Whole business is about 99 parts diarrhea to one part glory. All the suffering in the dead. Well, such thoughts are gloomy but even they have their place. There's a saying, God doeth all things well, the meaning of which after due time appears to the soul. My friends, no array of terms can say how much I am at peace about God and about death. I hear and behold God in every object, yet understand God not in the least. Why should I wish to see God better than this day? I see something of God each hour of the 24 and each moment then. And in the faces of men and women, I see God and in my own face in the glass. As to you, death, and you, bitter hug of mortality, it is idle to try to alarm me. I am the poet of death and the poet of life. I welcome you. Come lovely and soothing death, undulate around the world, serenely arriving, arriving in the night, in the day, to each, to all, sooner or later, delicate death. And as to you, corpse, I think you are good manure, but that does not offend me. I smell the white roses, sweet-scented and growing. I reach to the leafy lips. I reach to the polished breasts of melons. As to you, life, I reckon you are the leavings of many deaths. No doubt I have died myself 10,000 times before. The smallest sprout shows there is no death, 
and if ever there was, it led forward life, and does not wait at the end to arrest it and cease the moment that life appeared. All goes onward and outward, nothing collapses, and to die is different from what anyone supposed and luckier. Do you see, my brothers and sisters, it is not chaos or death. It is form, union, plan. It is eternal life. It is happiness. <laughs> Just happiness. With time, I've learned to humbly accept and thank God for whatever inspiration toward good might come in this rough world of ours and as far as may be possible to cut loose from and put the bad behind. Always, always, we must work, you see, at finding beauty in this life. Work at being grateful. Yes, I'm grateful. Looking back with you has made me realize a man has never been as fortunate as I've been in having had things done just as he planned. Take leaves of grass, for instance. It certainly is what I, I alone, deemed it should be. Proud indeed we may be, my book and I. Why should I call it a failure? Why this endless questioning of myself, whether lost, lost at last, unaccepted, unread, there at least it is direct from my own hands. Oh me, oh life, of the questions of these recurring, of the endless trains of the faithless, of cities filled with the foolish, of myself forever reproaching myself, for who more foolish than I, and who more faithless? Of eyes that vainly crave the light, of the objects mean, of the struggle ever renewed, of the empty and useless years of the rest, with the rest, me intertwined. The question, oh me, so sad recurring. What good amid these, oh me? O oh, life, what good amid these, O oh, me, O oh, life, answer that you are here, that identity exists, that the powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse. This is what you shall do. Love the earth and the sun and the animals despise riches, give alms to everyone that asks, stand up for the stupid and the crazy, devote your labor and income to others, hate tyrants, argue not concerning God, have patience and indulgence towards the people, take off your hat to nothing known or unknown or to any man or number of men, Go freely with powerful, uneducated men and with the young and with the mothers of families. Read these leaves every season of every year of your life. Re-examine everything you've been taught at school or church or in any book and dismiss whatever insults your own soul. And your very flesh shall be a great poem and have the richest fluency not only in its lines, but between your lips and eyes, and between the lashes of your eyes, and in every motion and joint of your body. Oh, is this? <laughs> oh, I think it is. Horace's notebook. <laughs> well, he'll be glad to have these ramblings of an old gray poet. I have developed quite a knack for gabbing and loitering, perhaps you've noticed. I even talk to myself sometimes, especially whilst outside walking in the woods. The spotted hawk swoops by and accuses me. He complains of my gab and loitering. I too am not a bit tamed. I too am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yop over the roofs of the world. 
The last scud of day holds back for me. It flings my likeness after the rest, and as true as any in the shadowed wilds, it coaxes me to the vapor and the dusk. I depart as air. I shake my runaway locks at the sun. I effuse my flesh in eddies and drifted in lacy jags. <laughs> I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. <laughs> if you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nonetheless and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you.